Weights and Biases Salon. So while folks are coming in, I thought I'd ask a, a, little, a little poll question as we've done at a few of these previous salons. Uh, so today was the final official announcement of the new NVIDIA line of GPUs, the 3000 series. Uh, and there's a lot of excitement by folks in the deep learning community about these, including Jeremy Howard of Fast AI. So uh, he was tweeting that pretty much everyone doing deep learning that can afford a 3090 is going to be buying at least one. Uh, so the so stats of these, uh, these new GPUs are uh, right there uh, next to my face. And so the question I wanted to ask was, are you going to be picking up one of this new line of NVIDIA GPUs? Uh, so you can answer this question uh, by going to itempool.com slash wandb slash live. Uh, and yeah, just let us know. Are you thinking about picking up the RTX 3090? That's the beefy one. It's got 24 gigabytes of RAM. Maybe the, maybe, you know, that, but that one costs $1,500. So maybe you're one more for the, a little bit more economical $700 RTX 3080. That's the one that I have my eyes on for my, for my home machine. Oh, and it looks like our other panelist has joined us. Uh, hey there, Andrew. Uh, so he'll be going second. Well, who we have coming up first is uh, Dylan Payton of the Betke Lab at Tubingen. So folks are still coming in on YouTube and on Zoom, so I'll give them a second. Uh, uh, just to remind you, if you want to participate in this little poll here about, uh, about, the, about the new NVIDIA GPUs, head to the URL that's uh, above my head there, itempool.com slash wanbe slash live and answer. So that's also been dropped into the chat, uh, the, the Zoom chat, if you want to see it. Uh, and I'll make sure that uh, Kayla drops that also into our YouTube chat. So we'll come back to that and we'll see what the results are uh, in between the two talks. Uh, so uh, with, uh, with that out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and get started with the actual talks. So Dylan is joining us from Germany. It's very, very late there. So thanks a lot, Dylan, for being willing to uh, uh, stay up late to share the work that you've been doing with uh, everybody in the in the salon community. Uh, yeah, no so, problem. yeah, uh, Dylan is a good friend of mine because we worked together at the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at the, at Berkeley. We did our PhDs there. Dylan was in visual science. I was in neuroscience. Uh, can I make it any more obvious? Uh, to quote <laughs> Avril Lavigne. Uh, so uh, Dylan's been doing some really great work with the Betke Lab, and I'm really excited to see uh, what, uh, what he has in store for us. Uh, so Dylan, go ahead and take it away. Okay, cool. All right, you can see that okay? Yep. All right, yeah, so uh, thanks a lot, Charles, for, for having me. I'm excited to talk about this work. It's a new approach to unsupervised representation learning. Uh, with specific application to disentanglement. I worked on it with these people named on the slide. Um, and like Charles said, in Matthias Betke's lab at the University of Tübingen. Uh, okay, so just get started. Uh, I'm just gonna, just as a quick overview, I'm gonna spend some time talking about disentanglement. Um, what is it? Why is it important? Where does it come from? What has been done so far? Uh, and then I'll go into our approach for disentanglement, which includes introducing new data sets uh, intended to move the field towards more natural benchmarks. Um, so as Charles said, my background is in vision science. So I like to think about the task of disentanglement in the context of the human visual system. Um, generally, our task is to disentangle the original sources from the mixed signal that comes to our eye. Uh, and this is an extremely difficult task. Uh, one example of why is that our eyes have a 2D array of receptors and the world is in 3D. So for any image that would be projected under our eye, there's an infinite number of scenarios uh, that could uh, lead to that image. Uh, and this is also gonna be true for disentangling from digital images or videos. Uh, and so in disentanglement, we have what we call sources. And some example of these sources are highlighted in red. Uh, they're pretty intuitive. They're basically just like the high level descriptors that one would use to explain a scene. Uh, and so for, 
one observation that we can use to our advantage in the natural world is that certain properties of the world are generally persistent while others change. For example, if the tiger moves, it's still a tiger. Uh, or another example is as the day progresses, the lighting changes, the visual signal is going to change a lot, uh, but the tree is still a tree. Uh, and so you might notice that the two examples I just gave involve things that change over time, uh, and that's going to become important later when I explain our model. Uh, so ultimately, I'm interested in how the brain figures this out. None of the work that I'm going to present today is actually a proposal for specific computation in the brain. Um, we do provide a partial solution to this problem that exploits the statistics of the world. Uh, and we de demonstrate via an engineered approach that it's at least plausible that the brain could exploit such statistics as well. Um, so as with any problem in science, the first thing we want to do is simplify it as much as possible uh, and define it in co more concrete terms. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do here. here. Uh, on this slide in black, I have the steps that we'd be taking that are associated with disentanglement. In red, I have examples of what those steps might be. And in blue, I've assigned some variables to make it easier to talk about later. Um, so first, let's talk about the generator or the world. We have our sources, uh, which I'm calling S. Uh, and so in the case of like, for example, fake generated data, like in video games, we know exactly what those sources are. We have exact information for everything we need to make an image, like lighting and position, pose, identity. Um, for real world data, natural images and videos, uh, we don't know what all the sources are. We have to only guess. Uh, and these sources are mixed with the ground truth generative model. So for video games, it would be a graphics engine. And for natural signals, it's just like physical processes, light bouncing around, interacting with things in the world. And this mixture is a complicated process, produces these entangled signals, which we could think of as images. And then our goal is to try to disentangle that. Uh, so we want to learn something about this, this world process. One common next step is to use an encoder. So we want to recover sources from the mixed data uh, and produce a disentangled code, which we'll call latent code. Uh, many approaches also try to learn to generate new samples from the latent code. Uh, and so they learn to approximate the original ground truth generator and generate data samples. Um, so in our model, what we're going to learn or things we could learn are the functions f and g, um, which could be neural networks or other algorithms. In our case, they're going to be neural networks. Uh, and there's a few criteria that we might use to check to see if f and g are correct. Um, one is, does my latent code match my original sources? So if we have access to the original sources, we can just check that directly. Uh, does my encoder match the inverse of the ground truth generator? That's how the G star negative one means I'm looking at the inverse of that generator. Have I been able to undo that mixing process? Uh, or does my generator match the ground truth generator? And an easy way to check that is just, does my generated data look like the original ground truth data? And so if I generate a data set X, does it look like the data set X star? Uh, another common way to check that the latent code is sensible is to just purposefully vary the latent code Z and look at what happens in the generated images. So for example, if Z is a vector of 10 numbers and I want to vary just one of those numbers and I see that in my image, the size of an object changes without anything else changing, uh, then I can assign that specific number in Z a size label. Um, so there's a lot of different approaches to disentanglement and these different approaches use or focus on different portions of this task. Uh, so for example, ICA, independent component analysis, is a really common one that dates back to the 80s. Uh, and they only focus on the demixing part, the disentangling part. So the upsides of this type of algorithm is it's easy to consider, it's easier than considering the whole problem, uh, both in terms of the mathematical description and the applications. Uh, it really narrows down the true problem of disentanglement to the question of can we undo the process that happens in the real world. Uh, and another thing is it was proven a long time ago that it can produce identifiable solutions, which I'm going to describe more in a few slides. However, some downsides are, one, we don't know, we don't have a good way of verifying that we've preserved all of the information. So we don't really have a good way of checking that Z is, is, has all the information in X, whereas if we were regenerating data samples, then we would know for sure. And we also don't have a good way of generating new data, which has a lot of its own interesting applications. Um, so ICA has some been around for a very long time. And so there's a bunch of places where ICA gets used uh, in industry. Um, so some classic applications of ICA are the cocktail party problems. This is where you have a cocktail party, a bunch of people are talking, you have a couple of microphones in the room uh, and you're recording all the conversations. And so the conversations are getting mixed. And then the goal is to demix that conversation or disentangle it so that the output is individual persons, uh, what they're saying. 
Another example of ICA is estimating the underlying structure of natural images. So people have shown that you can take a natural image as input and the output is estimates of the core atomic elements that could be used to construct uh, those, those natural images, visual elements. I don't mean like literal atomic elements. Um, so another interesting application that I thought would be relevant with the recent or topical with the recent news on Neuralink is to look at brain data. So this is not the same type of data as Neuralink, but uh, still interesting nonetheless. And the reason why this is interesting is because uh, it allows me to, or it, it has relation to identifiability. So the task here is we have a EEG array. So it's just like a thing that goes in your head and it records brain activity. And the brain activity is coming from neurons. Neurons are producing electrical signals but they're getting mixed up. They're going through brain data, through your skull, et cetera. Uh, and so if we train a disentangling model on ICA, the goal is to get out relevant signals that are relevant to cognition or action or whatever. Uh, and so identifiability is important in this case. Um, what identifiability means is that we can guarantee mathematically that the solution it finds is the correct solution. Uh, and there's different amounts of identifiability uh, from an exact match to a match up to permutations or up to some linear operation. Uh, it was shown a long time ago that ICA can do uh, identifiable disentanglement when the process is linear, but it's actually impossible to do it when the process is nonlinear for the standard ICA algorithm. Uh, and so there have been solutions proposed uh, for quite a while for nonlinear ICA, but only in the last five years or so have they really started making advancements to realistic data. And these solutions assume that you have some additional information that we need, uh, that we didn't need with regular ICA. Uh, so with linear ICA, we can solve the problem just with random samples of the data, but with nonlinear ICA, we need more information like a label or time step or some guarantee that a certain number of sources are only changing from one time point to another. So another alternative method for doing disentanglement is with generative adversarial networks or GANs. Uh, and so these kind of look at the second half of the problem only. Uh, they just generate data from random samples of a latent code and then check that that data looks realistic. Uh, so in practice, these are the most successful in terms of large scale data sets. They can work on high definition images, much higher scale data sets than ICA. Uh, but they're difficult to construct a good metric for assessing disentanglement because you've completely disregarded the original ground truth sources in the whole framework. Uh, and so there's no notion of identifiability and therefore the model itself is less interpretable. And another important difference is that we can't actually apply it to the same tasks that we could apply ICA to. Uh, we can't, I can't give you data and have you uh, pass it through your encoder and give me sources. <clears throat> uh, so the third approach is the one that we used, um, which is to use autoencoders. So the autoencoder approach uses all the steps above and the upsides is in theory, all of the same upsides as the other two. Uh, however, generally it works in practice on larger scale data than ICA, but smaller scale data than GANs. Uh, and until very recently, there were not any approaches to prove identifiability for uh, very auto encoder based models. Um, but some recent work has shown that you can uh, produce an unidentifiable disentanglement code. I don't have time to go into that now, but I'd encourage people to check out our paper uh, or the references on the screen uh, to look into those. So our approach is using an autoencoder, so I'm going to spend the rest of my time focusing on that. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the background. Now I'm going to go into our approach, uh, which will start with looking at benchmarks that are used uh, for this task. Um, so disentanglement task is best done when you have a, a, a metric uh, that you can use to assess the performance. And so a big advancement was made recently in this with the disentanglement library. Um, and so this library, they use a collected a bunch of different generative graphics engines. Uh, and so that means we know the exact parameters uh, used to generate images. Uh, and um, it allows us to be able to verify the ground truth generating sources with what comes out of our model. Um, so as I alluded to before, it's been known for like 20 years or so that it's not possible to perform identifiable disentanglement when you're only getting independent image samples. Uh, and so what we have done uh, is achieved this identifiable disentanglement by extending these data sets into the time domain and then using time information to constrain our model 
using the, the uh, statistics that we found to constrain our model. Uh, so when extending it to the time domain, we asked the question of what time statistics do we want to use? And we decided to try to use real data. Uh, so the first data set that we used is YouTube. Uh, so we pulled videos straight from YouTube. Uh, and then um, this other group uses a pre-training image segmentation algorithm to extract these binary masks. Uh, and so we take the masks and we record the measure the scale and position data of the masks. And then we construct our own sprite data set using the measurements that we have. And we call that natural sprites. Uh, so natural sprites are images generating using the Sprite World Graphics Engine. Uh, so they're simple, well-controlled objects. We know all the parameters, like the shape and orientation and everything. Um, but we've added time component to the made them videos. And this these statistics of this time match exactly the statistics from these YouTube videos. Uh, so this is a step, the first step towards running this problem on realistic videos. As a next step, we just we used the kitty uh, data set. So this is masks extracted directly from self-driving car cameras. Uh, so we have these data set of videos from self-driving cars and the cars also have a LIDAR sensor. It's a laser depth sensor, uh, which makes it really good at detecting objects in the world. Uh, you know, if a person's in front of a car, they're going to be at a certain depth and everything else is going to be at a different depth. So it's easy to get a very fine grained mask. Uh, and so we Again, another group uses information to extract these masks. We pulled out the human category uh, and converted it into this data set. And again, we measure the position and area of these ground truth factors. So this is, a, again, a further step closer towards real video. The downside of this compared to natural sprites is that we've, with natural sprites, we have all of the parameters for generating the video. We know exactly what parameters went into the generating model. Whereas here, we only have the position and area. Uh, we, we're just limited by what we can measure. Uh, so now that we have these data sets, we wanted to build a model that exploits this, the statistics of this data uh, or is constrained by the statistics of this data. So we measured those statistics. Um, so these are looking at the time varying statistics. This is looking at transitions of these measurements from one frame to the next. And we found that the distributions are all sparse. So what that means is that they're peaked at zero uh, and they have very heavy tails. Uh, so that means sharp changes could occur in some latent sources, but most of the other sources would remain unchanged between adjacent time points. So now when I'm saying sources, I mean properties like position, identity and stuff, uh, size. So as an example, if you imagine you're sitting at a traffic light and someone's going across the crosswalk, uh, that person's X position might change quite a bit in time, but their size and identity and shape are relatively constant. Using these, this idea, we decided to constrain our model by imposing a prior that adhered to this, uh, this, this statistic that we see. Uh, so again, we have an autoencoder model. We get images uh, X, um, you can see on my pointer here, and then it goes through an encoder to get our latent code Z. And what we do is we establish a prior on our model uh, to impose this regularity that we saw uh, in the natural data. Uh, and so here, this is represented here by this heat map. Uh, so the darker red indicates a higher probability. So for the first time step, we don't really know anything about it. So we have a very general prior that we place in the model uh, and that's signified here. And the next time step, this is the, or sorry, this is the encoding at that first time step. So now we actually have seen the object and we know where it is, which we mark by the X and we have some probability distribution around it. We, given that information, we can enforce another prior of the time step T given time step T minus one. And this is the one that we asked to be sparse. So we again say that we only want a few of the latents to change, or we only expect a few of the latents to change. And now when we encode the next time step, because we have imposed this prior, we have a high likelihood of doing a good job at encoding the next time step. And I'm not gonna go into it very much, but it turns out that having this sparse prior because it is shaped the way it is, it allows us to prove identifiability with a very simple proof. Um, okay, so we applied this to, to both the data sets in the disentanglement lib, as well as our new data sets. Uh, and we found that we did a lot better than previous approaches. This is a really big plot. There's a lot going on. I'm just going to highlight the important points. 
most notably the red circle around our model, which does the best. Uh, and the way you can interpret these green boxes here is this is looking at the correlation between the latent components in Z and the ground truth factors. So each column is a different ground truth factor. So ideally, if it was a perfect solution, you would just see a dark green row uh, diagonal of 100, uh, indicating that every ground truth factor is perfectly correlated with one of the latents. Uh, and another way to look at it is to just look at the values themselves. So here, what we're doing is we're changing uh, those latent values and we're looking at how Z, or sorry, we're changing the ground truth values and we're looking at how Z changes with respect to that. And so again, a perfect solution would be a diagonal line or in the case of shape where there's discrete categories, we would just have separated points. Uh, and you can see that like a solution like this, for example, it'd be very difficult to decode what the X position was given a value of Z. Um, so the summary of some advantage of the advantages to our approach, uh, it's parsimonious. So our mathematical setup is simple. It can be applied to a lot of different data types, including videos with natural transitions. It's identifiable. So we prove that our model is more identifiable than previous approaches. By more, I mean, we have fewer constraints. It's applicable to broader set of data, broader uh, amount of data sets. Uh, and it's identifiable up to permutations as opposed to up to something like a linear transformation, which previous approaches were. Uh, and then we also just empirically show improved disentanglement on these more constrained data sets. Ultimately, our goal is to move towards natural data, um, but we believe that we've offered these data sets as a way to help push the field in that direction. Uh, yeah, and that's what I got. So this is the links that you can go to to check out more. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Open to questions. Great, so if folks have questions, you can put them in the Zoom chat or the YouTube chat and we'll pose them to Dylan. Uh, also, uh, you know, uh, Andrew, if you have questions, it'd be great to hear uh, any questions that you have. I'll kick us off with a couple of questions. So uh, the first question is, what do you think is needed to take these nonlinear disentanglement approaches and be able to apply them to, you know, full, you know, high definition natural video? Is it just calculation? Is it just like computation rather? Or is there, are there big algorithmic advances that need to be made? Um, yeah, that's a tough question. So it's not really clear what, so like autoencoders by themselves are capable of encoding and decoding high resolution images. Um, when you stick them in this variational framework, so this probabilistic framework where you're not just adding, asking it to encode an image and then decode that image, but you're also asking for the encoding to have these certain properties, it seems like the scalability kind of falls off uh, and so this might come down to just the network's ability to approximate this probabilistic distribution, which is what it's trying to do with variational inference. Uh, and so one thing that we're working on now with continuing this is to modify the architecture to an architecture that can handle, uh, like a recurrent architecture that can handle more complicated computation uh, without having to have an extremely deep network. Mm. Um, and so we're hoping that we can go farther with fewer layers uh, to, to try to scale up the model. Um, interesting. So Joshua Clancy from YouTube asks, how did you implement those priors? So how are those priors enforced on the, on the autoencoder? Sure, yeah. So it ends up just being a training loss, but it comes from a probabilistic description. So the variational autoencoder basically specifies that the uh, encoder itself solves a lower bound on uh, likelihood of the representation given the images. Uh, and so we end up with a loss function that is a term that asks that information is preserved as much as possible. So that's basically looking at the difference between X star and X. And then a second term that says that we want the latent space to look as much as possible like draws, random draws from these two probability distributions um, where, let's see, let me go back to the slide. So the one probability distribution is this just a standard Gaussian prior. So this is the standard prior that's used in all VAEs. And then we added a second probability distribution given the first time point we encode 
the first image, we use that image to condition our second prior. Uh, and then when we feed in the second image, we have a loss term for the, the second image using the second prior. So it ends up just being the same KL divergence or similar KL divergence term that you get in the standard VAE framework. Interesting. While we're on this slide, I think I just wanted to sort of check my understanding of your identifiability proof. The like essence of it is basically that if you look at that prior T given T minus one, you can see that it's axis aligned, right? That you see those two uh, like sharp lines oriented up, uh, up and horizontally and vertically. And that's what gives you identifiability that the axes are really important as opposed to that Gaussian prior where it's you know isotropic. And so there's no special directions of any kind. Yeah, exactly. So the, the prior that you're looking at here for T minus one, that's a, just a standard Gaussian prior, which is used for beta VAEs and other VAE approaches to disentanglement. And the problem with this prior is it's rotationally symmetric. So what that means is in my latent space, I can multiply my Z variable by a rotation matrix that can rotate at any arbitrary amount, and it would still be equally valid under our loss function. And so there's no way of knowing, given the loss, whether we actually found the right solution or not. Because the ground truth has one solution, and our latent has infinite solutions, depending on what rotation you do. And that's actually the core argument for ICA not being identifiable. Uh, and so yeah, the shape of our prior, the fact that we chose a sparse prior, it has these axis aligned probability densities, uh, marginals, that, that means that when you rotate it, it's not the same anymore. And so if it minimizes the loss, if it finds a solution, it is the right solution. And I should say that with this kind of stuff, like identifiability is proven in this, you know, mathematical sense. And of course, we have to relax a lot of those constraints when we apply the model in practice. Uh, and so it was important for us to do a lot of empirical tests at the same time. We show identifiability, but we also want to make sure that, you know, when we relax the constraints that we needed to impose to show identifiability to actually run it on real data, we still see a good job at disentanglement. So when you look at the results, like, no, it's not perfect, uh, but it's doing a lot better than everyone else. And at, in theory, given the right conditions, it should do perfectly. And we do test it on toy data like very toy data where it exactly matches all the conditions and then it perfectly disentangles it. Cool. Uh, that's, uh, uh, yeah, this is interesting work and I'm looking forward to see as you continue closer towards nonlinear disentanglement uh, in natural data. Uh, and uh, hopefully folks take up these data sets that you put out there, that kitty mask data set um, and you know improve on this and, and uh, make some steps towards better disentangling natural videos. Yeah, so a lot of the, the Yash and Lucas and David, they did a lot of work on the GitHub repository. So if you're interested in trying this out, you, the, that same repo is where you go to get the data uh, and also where you would go to test out our model. Um, and it integrates pretty well with the disentanglement library already and the metrics that they use. Great, uh, well, so that's all the time we have for uh, for Dylan's talk. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, and uh, so while we, uh, looks like uh, Andrew's getting ready, while, uh, yep. while that's happening, um, I want to reveal the results of our poll. So we asked folks whether they were going to pick up one of the new line of NVIDIA GPUs. And uh, let's, uh, let's see what folks said. And It looks like we've got uh, two people who aren't going to pick up anything, uh, two people who are going to pick up the 3090, and two people who are going to pick up the 3080. Uh, so interesting. Looks like people, uh, the 3070 there, the cheapest one, is I think 499. Really, you know, very affordable. But it looks like folks wanted something a little beefier. The the 3090 there with the 24 gigabyte uh, gigabytes of RAM, uh, really good for running, you know, your tiny GPTs uh, or or what have you. Uh, great. Well, thanks everybody for participating in the poll. And uh, let's uh, turn it over to Andrew. So I'm really excited. Hi, yeah. oh, hey, everybody. Hmm. Yeah, you can see I'm just sitting here in my backyard. Uh, so this is a real scene, not a fake one. Uh, still enjoying the good weather here. I'm just outside of Portland, Oregon. Um, 
actually, I'm going to ask you, Charles. I could go either two directions uh, presentations. Um, I was going to do my sort of generalized presentation on what people are doing in production here uh, in 2020. But since you were all talking about auto encoders and that, I have a about a 20, 25 minute long training presentation how to write auto encoders in TensorFlow. What do you think would be more appropriate for our audience? Um, yeah, I think that the the first thing that you that you mentioned is probably the uh, the best one, just a sort of general okay. overview. Um, All I think right, I'm we'll really excited that. about your uh, your deep learning design patterns book. Uh, that's what I've been uh, telling people about when I've been promoting the salon. So uh, it'd be great to see okay. some of those ideas and thoughts. Okay. All right. So let me. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Mm -hmm. Give me a moment. Chrome tab. There we go. Okay, people should be able to see my screen. Uh, yep. So I'll go in full presentation mode. Okay, uh, for those who aren't familiar uh, with me, I'm Andrew Frillich. I work at Google Cloud AI. I'm in developer relations. Uh, that means I'm, uh, I'm primarily external facing. So you'll see me at events like this. Um, sometimes I'm at universities as an adjunct professor. Um, other times I'm with some of our very large enterprise clients, uh, you know, helping uh, their, uh, their ML teams get over uh, production problems. But because I'm external facing and I'm out there a lot, I, I've had the opportunity over the last few years really to see firsthand uh, What's been transitioning in production uh, at you know at our very at the very largest places? Okay, so I'm gonna start here with a little timeline. Okay, so uh, Andrew, um, just a quick uh, quick note: the bottom of your slides, I think, are slightly cut off. I think if you just uh, yeah, I hear on some presentations that happens. So I'm gonna go out of full mode and just go like this. Okay, that way nothing gets cut off, right? Great. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, you know, when I started, uh, in, you know, in production, it was like early 2017. And the marketing data back then said there was about 10,000 data scientists. OK. And AI and ML was just coming on everybody's radar. And most of the people involved in the big companies, you know, you had decision makers, engineering staff. But they really lacked having, you know, really uh, data science or MLE people. So most of that workforce was being done as an ML consultant. Okay. By 2018, a lot of these companies were moving away from planning and discovery to exploration and prototyping. And so now you started to see senior engineering management involved. Typically, by now, at least one senior data scientist has been hired as a lead, and they're starting to fill in the team. You know, with data engineers, um, you, I started to notice that they tended to pull people from the DB, the database team, okay? And again, a, a strong dependence on ML consultants. Where we really saw the change uh, was in 2019. By now, you know, AI ML is a fundamental aspect of their business. Uh, you know, the CTO is involved. You now have really rounded out the data science team, hiring, you know, junior data scientists to support the senior data scientists. You have uh, machine learning engineers, data engineers. You're starting to bring in ML ops. And we also saw that they started using third party services like ML API services and uh, and turnkey solu what turnkey solutions were emerging at the time from integrated system vendors. By 2020, you know, which is the current, or at least before the pandemic hit, you know, um, really the, the, at the enterprise level, the entire C-suite is involved. Um, and you just see, you know, again, a continued growth in the number of people hired into these positions. And you also see a lot more use of what we call now managed services. And those like come not just you know, obviously Google provides managed services, but there are a, a lot of very large companies that do. And then really a big growth in turnkey solutions. And also the labor pool has changed a lot. We've gone from 10,000 
data scientists three years ago to now 250,000 data scientists worldwide and 2 million people who are characterized as ML practitioners. So it's been quite an explosion in the workforce. Um, so we'll just quickly go over sort of the transition uh, in the technology. Okay, so again, when I started in 2017, I'm going to our, our clients and we're talking plant, they're talking planning and discovery. They were still doing what I would call business intelligence, sort of that classical form of machine learning. They weren't doing uh, deep learning. The tools they tended to be using were Psychic Learn and the NL uh, uh, TK Toolkit. Uh, typically, they were doing cart analysis, and the background of many of the people involved was a statistics background. Um, 2018 is really when we started to see a big change, starting to move towards deep learning, starting to see bringing in TensorFlow and PyTorch, start using things like transfer learning, again, starting to use third-party services like ML APIs, managed training services. And then the backgrounds really started to expand of the people involved, went from stats to now uh, people with computer science and data backgrounds. 2019 um, continued to expand. We started to see more and more reinforcement learning coming in, more and more different ways of doing automatic learning, uh, built-in algorithms, hyperparameter search. And we started to see the use of a, of a lesser expensive uh, version of network architecture search called macro architecture search to sort of find new architectures to use uh, for training a model. And again, bringing in managed end-to-end -end services, turnkey services, and you know the backgrounds really you know started to expand and include operational people. What we saw or predicted in 2020 as companies move into full production is really building on the data validation side, okay? And on the other end, we're really starting to see an explosion, what we call automatic learning, okay? Let me just click this way. So here in 2020, what we see as far as roles at the enterprise level they tend to be split across two organizations. One of them we typically refer to as the innovation center and the other one is production. We see our research data scientists in the innovation center. Our applied data scientists, the more senior ones, tend to straddle the two. Some of them are in innovation, some of them are production. We also see that with the machine learning engineers. But then on the production side, you know, we additionally see the machine learning operations. We call them ML ops. We see our data engineers. And we're also seeing a new type of software engineer, a SWE, that we refer to as an AI application engineer. For the most part, they're doing their job the same way they always have, you know, with the same practices and processes. But the packages, the libraries uh, they're using now are AI libraries. And the other thing they have to get used to is historically, uh, you know, algorithms always uh, gave a, you could say, a single answer. Two plus two was always four. And now they have to learn how do I deal with an algorithm whose output is really a probability distribution. And that's also put into question how QA fits in. Again, QA has always been built on this uh, discrete world, you know, that there's every set of inputs has a certain exact output and you want to get, say, 100% of your tests correct. Well, what's the correct output? Okay. And so there's still uncertainty exactly how QA works in a world where our applications now work on probability distributions. So this is just kind of showing at the end of 2019 what was a typical production flow, okay? 
So again, you would have some kind of a data warehousing here. I represent as a, a data repo. Your data engineers have designed some system to distribute data on, on a regular or you could say recurrent basis uh, to, for model training at a scale. We're not training one model anymore. The organization may be training vast number of different models, but even within that one model, they will train multiple instances uh, to find out which one uh, will produce uh, the best result. And even within an instance, we have things called warm-up training, uh, where we do numerical stabilization in the model, and we might have sort of short train, multiple short trainings to get each one of these uh, ready for full training. And so there are just massive number of model trains. So once you got an instance of a model train, there's usually some kind of validation check. Um, typically, the organization now has a, a repository for their train models uh, where they can do uh, you know, tracking in the same way as source control, but now it's for models. So they're able to go to the repository in, in their internal evaluation, answer the question, is this instance of the model better than the previous one and if not I just repeat this process but if it is I'm going to go ahead and version control it and put it into the repo then finally we're going to deploy it but even at that point we really don't know that the model is actually going to be better when we put it in the in the wild we made that determination initially based on our value date validation data so we end up deploying it and they typically do some form of a b testing that is they have the original version out there the new version some people see their original some people see the new version and they have some metric where they can measure how well it's performing and based on that they're going to get insights, which leads to more data labeling, more data is added to the data warehouse, and then this cycle is just repeated, and it goes on continuous. So, um, you know, a couple of years ago, when I'd be talking to people in production at these companies, you know, how often they retrain a model, typically I heard 30 days, you know, and by the end of 2019, you know, a normal uh, retraining cycle was, you know, every week, seven days. And then in other cases, people are retraining literally every single day. Um, I'll pause for a moment. Somebody has a question. Yeah, I actually have a, a couple ones. Uh, one I'd like to know actually from that uh, 2019 production flow, um, you, what, what are some of the biggest gaps you've seen between validation performance and performance in that a b testing setting where you you know you actually have real real world data and real world yeah data. yeah the uh, you know the the biggest problems of course we have are fall into two categories uh uh serving skew and data drift okay and again uh since you're all big talking about distributions, you can actually re-explain those as distributions, but we won't. <laughs> I, I came back right out of distribution, distribution theories. Okay. Um, so it's for our audience, if you don't know what serving skew is, so your training data, let's say it's classes, a classification, you have 10 classes and you have a certain a number per class percentage. Okay. And you train it in proportion to that. You keep it balanced. Okay. And let's say not, let's say I had 10 classes and nine of them are highly accurate, 98%. And then there's a 10th class. That's not so good. It's more like 70%. But when you report the average across all 10, it looks really high, uh, 94%. And you're really happy. And then you put it out there in the real world and you're only getting 70%. You know, you're asking what's going on. Well, it turns out almost everything it sees is from that tenth class. <laughs> okay, and that's called a serving skew. The distribution of what it's not that what it sees is different than what it's trained on, but the frequency, the distribution, and the frequency. Okay, so we call that serving skew. That's one problem we hit. Another one we hit is data drift. You just see examples we never trained on. They're from a different, they may be from the same population, but they're from a different distribution. Okay. So you have to look at it. No matter what I'm training on, I really don't have 
every possible example out there. So let's say you're trying to train a model to uh, predict the shoe size of every male in North America based on some features. So the population would be if you had every exact adult male in that number, but you don't. So you got some subpopulation, okay? And the question is, how represented is that subpopulation? That's your statistic, okay, of the overall population. In general, it's not. And so in data drift, your model is seeing a subpopulation of the same population, but it's a different subpopulation. And that's what one of the big things we try to find in A-B testing. And then that gives us insight into two things. Uh, labeling more data, getting more data, it's more representative, but also making validation slices that represent not just the training data, but the serving skew and the data drift. Hopefully I didn't take too long answering that question. <laughs> yeah, those, are, those are great, great answers. Um, and yeah, it's interesting to see that those problems are sort of classical statistics in, in a lot yes, of ways. Yes, they're absolutely yeah. classical statistics. Uh, yeah, um, also, uh, one more question, if you, okay. if you yeah, before you uh, move on from Jan Chang on Zoom, how would architecture search fit into that production flow? Is that part of it or is that something separate? Yeah, I, I see that as something separate. You know, obviously the uh, architecture uh, uh, search produced that model that's being trained in that production flow diagram. And, uh, I, you know, my presentation has six parts. I don't know how far we'll go. I'll have you cut me off when we're done. But each one's independent. But one of them actually talks about the trends and using uh, those types of techniques in production. Gotcha. Well, I want to hear as much as possible. So I'm going to let you okay. uh, keep going. On uh, we'll continue parts. on. Okay. Okay. So another big thing uh, really changed in 2019 is I call this not just a model anymore. Okay, so so up until, you know, in 2017, 2018, typically we trained individual models. Okay, and even if an application used multiple models, they were still separate models. You, you tended to have some uh, back end application on a server like written in Java or C sharp. And your models uh, uh, tended to be deployed like as a microservice or an HTTP endpoint. And your backend uh, uh, application would make calls out to them. Okay. Well, we don't really do it that way. Uh, nowadays, we actually uh, build applications that are a composition or what we call an amalgamation of the models. Okay that where the models are interconnected to themselves. And also the ultimate goal is that collection, that amalgamation of the models becomes the entire application. The whole idea of a backend application, making these calls out to these models go away. And what we're finding is these models, as we move towards amalgamations are becoming more multitask. They're more, they're doing more self or meta learning. Um, they're sharing common layers and they're connecting between each other via learned embeddings. So I'm kind of going to sort of step you how we get there. So I'll talk. I'm a computer vision uh, person, so I always put everything in the context of computer vision. That's my expertise. OK, so today when we look at models, there are uh, standard design patterns, okay? And in the convolutional neural network world, we look at them as being broken into three major components, uh, a stem, a learner, and a task. So the stem is really where the image data is coming in, and we do this first course level generation of feature maps. It's sort of prepping the system. And one of the important thing is, is depending on the size of the image it wants to it's going to do some dimensionality reduction but it wants to do it in a way that matches what our expectations are when we get to the end of the learner because at the end of the learner is what dylan uh, referred to as the latent space we want it to be a certain dimensionality okay and so that's the job of the stem okay the learner is what we do net what we say now does representational learning 
And what we mean by that is we want to learn the essential features of the data, which is really kind of different than the past where we said we wanted to learn the data or the data set. Well, that approach really led to what we call memorization. Okay, where you really just end up memorizing the data. And what we really want to do is, quote, not learn the data, but learn what are the essential features that make up the data. And that's the only thing we want in the latent space. So, again, that's not really very different uh, than Dylan. Sometimes we do pre-training on these models using an encoder portion of an autoencoder or a GAN or synthetic data uh, just to force the model to sort of um, initially sort of what you call, you know, uh, set itself on learning only essential features. And so that's the learner. And then finally the task. Now that I got this latent space, what is the task I want to learn? Uh, it could be something simple as classification. It could be multitask as an, uh, as an object detection. You're learning two classes, uh, two tasks. You're learning a bounding box and you're learning to classify what's inside that bounding box. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I brought up uh, object detection. Okay. So, this is just to remind people that today models are multi, many models nowadays in production are multitask. I consider object detection sort of the granddaddy of them all. Okay. So, you start your STEM convolutional group. Again, gets those original feature maps ready at the right size, right dimensionality. It's got that course level feature extraction. Then you're going to have this convolutional body or net, and that's your reuse because you're going to reuse it for multiple purposes. Okay. Sometimes they refer to the output of that as the shared feature maps. And so there's various things you want to do here. So in an RPN is you want to propose regions within the image that might be an object. So these are like your candidate bounding boxes. And then you want to pull them together, ones that are overlapping and so forth, to sort of a final, smaller, final set of candidates. And then you're going to classify each one of those. Is this a bounding box, a foreground, or a background? And if it's a foreground, then you want to classify what's in it. <laughs> and on top of that, you want to then fine tune the bounding box around it. So here you have a classifier and a regressor. OK, so let's kind of move to full scale model amalgamation. So one of the areas uh, enterprise customers I've worked with for Google is in sports uh, broadcasting. OK, and this is the kind of amalgamation that we we help them with. So obviously it's sports and they have some live video. And so that's going into a shared convolutional neural network. And you got shared layers. And that shared layers, the outputs from them, go into an object detection uh, model. Okay, so that gives us a, a, a chance to say what's in that frame. So you have everything from, you know, detecting a person, detecting a bat, detecting a ball, uh, detecting uh, audience in the stadium, and so forth. So there's all your object detection. But these are also embeddings. These are those little latent spaces. OK, and what we can do is we can use their location in the original image to crop them out of the latent space. So it's not the entire latent space, just little crop outs out of them. We call them object level embeddings. We can take those object level embeddings and identify the ones that are classified as a person pass that embedding in the models is not trained on the original image. It is trained on the embe object embedding is the output of this to recognize the players. Okay. And if it's a player, then to take that information, those same embeddings to another model trained on those embeddings to do pose estimation. So it might say, you know, realize uh, the player is standing in a batting position. So now look at all the things I have. I have the information about who, what player it is. I know his pose. I have all these object embeddings. I put them together. We now have a dense embedding. And we can put that 
into another model trained on that output to predict the action. For example, uh, you know, again, context of baseball player at the, you know, uh, at the mound ready to bat. Okay. Because we can predict that action, we can take that predicted action into an image captioning model, produce the, uh, the closed caption text, uh, Today, broadcasters send their, you know, the sports games all over the world. So you can have automatic translation into uh, the particular market. Okay. And then for those who are, um, say, visual or, or, or maybe it's radio or something, they're able to then take that and go text to speech. The important thing here is this whole process of models, there's no back end application. This entire amalgamation of models is the application okay just got three more slides on this section and the last questions um another area we we work on uh i call it model fusion because it has some similarities to the autonomous world with sensor fusion okay so uh we work with utility companies okay and of course they got transmission the big giant transmission lines um, historically, a long time ago, for maintenance purposes, they actually would fly periodically a helicopter out, you know, into the mountains where all these uh, big uh, transmission towers are. There'd be a three-person crew. You'd have the pilot. You have uh, some guy with binoculars looking out, staring at these poles, trying to spot defects or problems, and then a third person taking those highly expensive okay well eventually they trained drones uh to in a sense do the flying but you had two people in back otherwise you know uh, visually observing again it's before you had a model but you got rid of the high cost of the helicopter and the pilot then eventually of course with deep learning they were able to train object detection models okay that could classify you know, what it saw there for defects or for maintenance. And this was a dramatic reduction in, in cost and is fairly standard throughout the whole industry. But the thing was, is that there's an older technology on every one of these transmission poles, okay? When there's a problem, a break, or something's just not right, okay? It changes the impedance in the line. And so there's these impedance sensors, this old IoT technology that is continuously transmitting uh, information back to the utility company. The problem is, is reliability of these sensors because that impedance value changes in it. And what it means can be caused by, can be affected by things simply by climate and other uh, things, okay? So you can't use like one set of numbers and say this number always means that. But it turns out that since they're flying these and these are now already trained and automatically classifying, the output of these guys now become the labels for this old school IoT technology and they're able to train an anomaly detection uh, model with high accuracy with these low cost technology using this drone who's been otherwise machine learned to be the labeler for it, further reducing the cost. Um, so uh, another area I've, I've worked with several uh, internet, large internet companies whose uh, business has something to do with homes, <laughs> you know, anything from selling them, renting them to renovating them. OK, and we have one basic pipeline uh, amalgamation uh, that works for all of them. OK. And the basic premise here uh, is they'll have a website. And you, as a user, you're going to upload pictures of your home, okay? So the first step is, is to have a model, a simple binary classifier model that determines, is that picture an interior or an exterior? And for the moment, I'm going to skip what's inside here. That's in the next slide. But they're practically a mirror of each other. But the output of whatever this amalgamation is, that output, that embedding goes into three back-end models, 
Okay, one's going to classify as a multi-class classifier, and it's going to classify the market appeal per demographic. Another model take that same information, the same latent space or embedding, be a regressor and come up with a valuation such as how much the house would sell for, or how much it should rent for, and then another regressor for、uh, renovation, like in repairs. So let's kind of look at the interior of what's inside of this that makes the amalgamation. Okay, so let's go back here. Coming out of the binary classifier isn't just a yes or no, interior or exterior. Remember, I say these are multi-output models that share from different layers. So you have an embedding. So the embedding coming out of this is now the input to that interior. So the interior is not seeing the original image anymore; it is seeing that embedding.、Uh, this is typically two-tier. Okay. So first, we want to do a coarse-level object detection of what type of room it is, particularly for inside the house. Is it a living room? Is it a dining room? Is it a kitchen? And then for that room,、uh, another object detection on a detail level: what you know, items in the room. So you know, if you're talking about a kitchen, you might be talking about you know the stove, the refrigerator, or the table and the Bathroom. You might be talking about the shower or the toilet, etc. Well, those are our anemones. Okay, and again, it's object detection. It knows the the location in the embedding where it is. It can crop it out, which spatially maps back to the original image. So we got all these tiny cropped embeddings that are your anemones. At the same time, we take that same information from that embedding and train a multi-class classifier on a per-room basis to classify the overall condition. Okay. Now you take that condition, or first you take these embeddings, and then on us from them, just like we did here at a coarse level, at a fine level, we have three models. One is classifying the condition of an individual anemone. Another one, the market appeal. Another one, the valuation. Collectively, all these anemones come out. They exit here along with the overall condition of the room for one big dense、uh, embedding, and that's what came out here that did that final aggregation. So that's an amalgamation. So I'll pause for a moment、uh, for anybody to ask a question. Uh, yeah, so it's it's about six o'clock, which is usually when we wrap up. So、okay. uh, I I think we should. I would love to actually ask you a couple questions before we go, but I don't think we'll be able、okay. to hear any more of your presentation. Okay,、uh, that's fine. Yeah, go, go for、uh, some questions. But,、uh, yeah, so Gary Kuvich on Zoom asked a really great question. Are there any papers that you can share with us on this like concept of amalgamations and maybe architectures and training styles that are best for this style of、um, machine learning? You no, know, I I. Amalgamations isn't really something that people in research really the direction they would go. They're they're not think you know they're 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 they're, they're thinking theoretical, you know. So amalgamations are more of it's just a practice that has evolved、uh, with people in production who have to work with vast number of moving parts, okay, and trying to move away, you know, trying to make them more efficient. And the way to make them more efficient is you got to move away from that backend application on a server. You just somehow have to get rid of that.、Uh, yeah, that makes sense. And I was gonna say、uh, that that in my time in academia, you know, this wasn't really on people's radar. I mean, the idea of like transfer learning is definitely something people talk about, but it it doesn't. It feels a little different than this like amalgamation idea、uh, yeah. that you're talking about. Yeah, in my、uh, deep learning book, I definitely have a、uh, significant sections on amalgamation. It's you know, it's one of my ex. You know, everybody at Google Cloud is an expert at you know one or more things. You know, they're all great people. And one of the things I'm an I've made myself an expert at is how at the enterprise level companies are doing amalgamations. Great. I'll make sure to share your uh, uh, a link to your book, the early access、uh, version of your、yeah. book on Manning, with、uh, the attendees on Zoom and and YouTube, so they can check that out. Yeah, yeah, and、uh, yeah, and I'm not sure if you have my YouTube channel、uh, for like the first dozen chapters of the book. I have a、uh, YouTube presentation 
It's like, uh, you know, uh, the cliff notes for the chapter. <laughs> Yeah, I'll make sure that gets uh, that gets shared. And also, if you have a, a link to the slides, if you could send that to me, I can send that out to I, our attendees. I can definitely do that, Charles. Great. Um, OK, uh, I haven't seen any other questions besides uh, wanting okay. to get access come in. Sure. Um, I had one question that I want to make sure that we uh, that I don't get it, that I don't miss my chance to ask, uh, which okay. is in some of your earliest slides, you mentioned uh, the in 2017 there were 10,000 data scientists and now there's yeah. 250,000 of them. So yeah. what do you think? You know, what do you think is the 25x growth that's going to happen between 2020 and 2023? Do you think that there's an opportunity for that kind of explosive growth elsewhere in machine learning and data science, or do you think it's well, somewhere else? I I I think we're going to as far as the high end definition of a data scientist, I think that's pretty much going to plateau out. OK, um, I think the advancement of, of, of these frameworks and tools, uh, a lot can be accomplished, you know, with, with, with more of a machine learning engineer. OK, mm -hmm. OK, uh, but I do see as we gradually teach uh, programmers what I call how to program the graph. It's a different way of thinking. Once they learn to program a graph, they're a machine learning engineer. Okay. Um, my belief is just a matter of a few years where effectively all application programmers will be programming the graph. Somewhere on the graph they'll be programming. Um, we see numbers in marketing data that currently there are about 25 million, pro 25 million programmers in the world. So given that, it should be about a, a tenfold growth. Interesting. OK, that's a. Uh, but again, that's just my opinionated view of the world that everybody's going to be programming somewhere on the graph. <laughs> um, yeah. And amalgamation is really a graph of graphs with right. subgraphs communicating uh, with each other. <laughs> Right. So you're not back propagating through that entire amalgamation graph. You're just doing no, it through individual no. ones, but it still no. is a, you know, a graph of interconnected nodes. Graphs. Gotcha. That's an interesting perspective. And, uh, you know, I certainly would love it if every programmer learned to do a little bit of machine learning. It, it would mean sure. definitely job security for people who teach machine learning. Uh, which <laughs> I really, would really like. Yeah. 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 That's kind of one of the things I do. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, well, it was a pleasure to have you on the salon. Uh, thanks a lot for okay. coming by. Uh, thanks to everybody uh, also for tuning in. I'm going to just do a quick promo uh, before we go for everything else. Uh, so our panelists okay. can uh, can head out if they'd like. Uh, but uh, yeah, let me pop up. Uh, so one is in two weeks. Uh, we're going to have Robert Nishihara of uh, Ray and AnyScale. Uh, who will be talking about using AnyScale and Ray and Raytune as tools to perform machine learning at any scale, whether that's an individual project all the way up to you know 10,000 GPUs. Uh, so that'll be in two weeks on September uh, 15th. Also, you can catch the launch that you missed on uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, just search for Weights and Biases on YouTube. Uh, we've also got uh, other videos up there, including our podcast, Gradient Descent. Uh, which has a really great video with Jeremy Howard talking about the future of machine learning uh, and Julia, and also, uh, I think, some stuff about changing diapers. Uh, so real, real uh, renaissance <laughs> man uh, and a real interesting podcast. Uh, and then also, uh, like, besides these, uh, those kinds of events, we also have a Slack forum, the Weights and Biases forum. Uh, you can sign up for it at bit.ly slash WB hyphen Slack. Uh, and... Uh, we just had the CEO of Kaggle on to answer a bunch of questions last Friday. We tend to do those almost every Friday. We have uh, a new AMA. We had somebody from the PyTorch development team on. Uh, and it's really a great chance to get in-depth answers to questions that you have. Uh, so uh, the, there's other things in our Slack, lots of great conversations happening all the time. Uh, but uh, you know, so you should join us. Uh, come through. Uh, and. Uh, whether you join us or not, uh, I will hopefully see you in two weeks at our next salon. So thanks a lot to everybody, especially to Dylan and to Andrew and everyone. Take care.